then telefilm. They were returning to their homeland, imbued in a belief in a new and brighter future. There were others too, following the victorious train loads, but there were no flowers for them. Those were the Soviet POWs, branded as traitors. They were hauled from German to Soviet concentration camps, some two million men and officers alike. Arrest started all over again. For an incautious word, appreciation of the West, or any sort of misdeed, things were back to how they were. After a war, film three. Special purpose camps became a novelty introduced by the KGB in post-war years. It meant a toughened regimen, additional rows of barbed wire, handcuffs and numbers on the prisoner's back, chest and cap. A person became known by his number rather than his name. Ex-POWs ended up in such camps. During the war, I was imprisoned two and a half years at a German POW camp. Solovyov, Sergei Dmitrovich, born in 1916, Kolomai inmate condemned under Article 58. The Americans came over. They wanted to send us to the Russian side. I found myself in Belgium. Our guys were taken to different places. Many worked in mines. Me too. Under a wartime agreement, all those born in the USSR must be repatriated. But the local authorities helped us to stay. I elected to go, though, for I was terribly homesick. I didn't know what was in store for me. I was overconfident and feared nothing at all. Nothing at all. 
Такая уверенность была и безбоязнь. Я совершенно не боялся. I was sentenced to 25 years of prison by a martial tribunal. When we Russians first got abroad, we came back totally different people. A tremendous lie was revealed that all the peoples lived terribly, that they were tortured everywhere. This lie was meant for idiots alone. The Russians began to develop new ideas. Among the soldiers, there were decent, worthy, sensible people who were able to analyze our past and what we had then and what lay ahead. We had enough brains to understand what was going on. Who knew then that the long-awaited amnesty after victory wouldn't apply to politicals? The great terror of 1937 was coming anew. New generations were falling victim to an undeclared war with the people. The Kolomak camps were depopulated in the war years and gold output declined. An influx of cheap labor alone could ensure the operation of an empire like Tolstoy in the Far East area covering one-seventh of the country. Massive repression started again. Yes, I was totally rehabilitated. I was shot twice at Coloma. One bullet smashed my elbow. The other hit me in the head, across the skull. Zhigulin Anatoly Vladimirovich. Born 1930, a Kolomá inmate, condemned under Article 58, rehabilitated. My friends and I wanted to escape. They perished. And I, and I found myself in the zone. It was impossible to flee from Kolomá. I was beaten, kicked by a soldier's boots. My ribs and teeth were broken. They aimed at my groin and liver. I was lucky enough to survive. I found myself in Coloma because I was in an underground youth organization operating in Varones in 1949, a group with a five-member core structure. That was the simplest underground structure. Our objective was to remove Stalin from power. Our platform was based on the principles of Marxism-Leninism. Sharing in an organization like this was a veritable crime. Our guilt was there to be sure, it gave us strength. Found guilty, we felt better than those taken without any guilt at all. We took pride in fighting against this regime. And we were imprisoned for a cause. The inmate is suppressed. He is trampled. The fist and stick are a means of argument. A punch in the face is a means of coercion. Power is corruption. Once unleashed, the beast hidden in man's soul seeks delight in murder. 
убийствах. This happened with me. A restricted area was being set up. White planks with pegs were being built around the workplace. A guard said to me, Hey, 594. My number was E594. I still keep it. My camp number. Cut down that little tree. It's blocking my view. I said, but it's outside the zone. You have my permission. Then our mate yelled. Zhigulin, Raevsky, don't go. All team, lie down on the sleepers between the rails. Don't obey the escort's orders. He wants to kill you. Senior officers showed up, and this guard was sent to a military mental hospital. Guards often killed prisoners. They've got Tommy guns and a belief that we are the enemies of the people. For a week, I'd known that he wanted to kill me. I knew it. But I'd never understood why I felt this way. It was like biocurrents. Amazing. investigator and the doctor are all vile, of course, but the criminal's world is far more corrupt. After all, the former have a touch of humanity, but the thieves are not human. Their moral impact on camp life was boundless. They beat to death dozens of thousands. They corrupted hundreds of thousands. And those they corrupted equally ceased to be human. However unpleasant it is to recall, thieves were the only ones to resist the guards. The Vedinsky Volya Vadimovich, born in 1930, a Koloma inmate condemned under Article 58, rehabilitated. Among us politicals was a former army commander. He was so timid he'd die from a cart creaking. We read about heroes like him in textbooks, but these same heroes allowed themselves to be humiliated and outraged by the cons. This is not to mention the guards. Convicts fall into two categories, thieves and bitches. Thieves imply the dignified underworld, one that declines to serve camp supervisors. Then there were the bitches. They were the team leader squealers. They would beat prisoners and extract job quotas. They would beat you with whatever was in their hands. They killed and were never punished. Those were the bitches. Should a small party of thieves get into a bitch camp, they were destined to either die or turn bitch. I watched the following scene. 
Everyone was lined up. The chief was sitting in a chair under a pole. Attached to the pole was a rail used to signal the guards. Two guys holding knives brought out a young thief from the punishment cell and marched him along the formation. Then he was led to the pole and handed a small crowbar. He gave three knocks on the rail suspended from the pole. That was ritual. The bitch's chief then got up from the chair, solemnly unzipped his fly, and the hapless thief would kiss his penis. Then he was handed a dagger, thus turning him into a full-fledged bitch. Then he was supposed to kill some of his old mates. Then he ceased to be human. There was the entire formation standing. Mujiks, foilers, friars. Then there was him, keeping mum before them, with all feeling ashamed. I thought then, I'd rather die. After the war, I made a trip to sign up at the university. The rector himself received me, but in my application form, I wrote that I was in the territory under German occupation. So he said, we cannot accept you. Applying to a shipbuilding institute, I concealed this fact and was enrolled. Minka Elena Simeonovna, born 1926. Koma inmate condemned under Article 58, rehabilitated. Suddenly, on January 17th, the door flung open, and in stepped three men, with stripes on the sides of their uniform trousers. I instantly realized these were office holders. My heart said, they've come to get me. I had one goal in my life, and that was getting married. What have I done? Why? You've betrayed your homeland, and you're better off dead. I stood before four military tribunals. Within 20 minutes, I was sentenced to 25 years in prison. An escorted party was formed all across Mother Russia, going to the Far East. At the pier, men were loaded into one hold, women into another. Female thieves were grouped together. They had razors and used them. Clothes were taken away and gold teeth were knocked out with spoons. So I was stripped down. The hold wasn't yet filled full. And right in the center, I saw a many-tiered structure, like a beehive. Having come closer, I saw those were prison beds. Women kept arriving there. They wailed and showed resistance. They went to the kolama, well nigh and closed. Suddenly there was a knock on the partition. A knock with an axe or a crowbar from the other side. The blows were getting stronger. In a lip-shaped hole developed and a mob of hooligans streamed in. All bare-chested, tattooed all over. A 
They grabbed the women and drugged them onto the plank beds. They screamed, of course. The very sight of them and the onslaught were horrendous. We bunched by the gangway. A virgin. I was horrified. I tried to get out onto the deck, setting my feet against the wall. Wails and cries. I also cried. I prayed too. I cried, Oh Lord, help me. Get me out of here. I don't remember whether I cried in a coherent language. The guard fired some warning shots. The mob retreated and descended into the next to last step. Women were being raped on all tiers of the plank beds. The whole scene was beyond description, something totally incredible. The escort with a Tommy gun yelled, I'll open fire. That was a lucky moment for me. I grabbed hold of his gun like this. He thought I was trying to wrest it from him. I simply held on to it. He stepped back reflexively, and I instantly dashed onto the deck. Nagaeva Bay, our place of destination at long last. How many days we sailed, I really don't know. Suddenly we saw fire trucks approaching the pier. The hatch was lifted and all were ordered out. But nobody rose. A massive rape was going on. The Kolyma tram. Convicts wouldn't let the women free. To separate them from the rapists, a mighty fire pump was used. The lower beds were flooded down there. There was a card game on with people's lives as the stakes. The stabbed were tossed from the beds. Dead bodies and human wastes were seen floating around. Boat hooks were used to fish the bodies out. Ex-POWs came from the camp and the convicts' control was shaken. Men with frontline and prison experience headed the fight against the convicts serving the camp superiors. They knew how to take risks and believed in force. At times, political prisoners, especially ex-POWs, joined thieves in fighting the bitches. Like Nazis, the Zemia and Geisha tortured and executed people, thereby fulfilling their superior's will. Servicemen ganged up in secret and used axes and crowbars to disarm Geisha. Afterwards, they killed his supporters in the working zone. Tzimia 
His deputy was in the residential zone. I don't know about his ethnic background. Villains and butchers have no nationality. Dezimia and his clique were in the cell. The bandits decided their lives were above their chieftains. They chopped off Dezimia's head and they showed it through the cell's window. They were kept alive, but their limbs were smashed. Humans would be too much a word for those beasts. There was a special machine to cut square blocks. Gyesha was tied to a large block and was left to move slowly towards the rotating saws. He yelled, asking for mercy. He wanted to survive, to live, you see. But the saws cut him into pieces. Well, it was a severe punishment, but fair enough. The capital of the Kolyma area was developing rapidly. A socialist-type city was rising on permafrost earth. Ranks of prisoner builders marched along its streets in the morning, escorted by guards with dogs. The building site was encircled with barbed wire. As the city grew wider, the building site with barbed wire was extended. There was also an engineer's office. Construction was very hard. Nikishov, the third successive Dolstroy chief, allowed me to recruit convicts for design work at building sites. I succeeded in selecting them. You would see an emaciated man totally resigned to his fate, overwhelmed by scurvy, and you'd ask him, Who are you? A former engineer, a former professor. So I managed to get people together. Some of them were probably involved in designing the Dolstroy headquarters. The chief had a spacious office. He was General Nikishov, hero of socialist labor. The Kulama boss lived close by in well-appointed quarters. He had guards and numerous servants from among the convicts. The situation in Magadan was special. It was the headquarters of top officials, a few generals residing behind the Iron Curtain. I frequented their parties. I socialized with them. I could feel their spiritual poverty. They tried to outdo each other in smart clothes and so on. Grabbers, they sought to squeeze everything out of the convicts. Vera Shukaeva used to embroider their nightgowns. She was a craft artist and lived in Paris for 14 years. Were there many embroiderers like here? Yes, there were. And they all worked for the top crust, doing household jobs, cooking. That was a world fenced off from other people. Incidentally, voluntarily enlisted personnel were hostile towards the superiors. Too obvious was the material inequality. Frequent parties, tables groaning under choice food. 
All this was nothing out of the ordinary for them. They could do whatever they elected to do. Nikoshov could put a mine supervisor in a penalty cell. Fear was always there. Kuridasova, Nikoshov's leather jacking wearing mistress, could do whatever she chose to do. Having sent his family back to the mainland, he appointed Madame Grudesova to be the Magadan camp's chief. As a result, she dispensed with human destinies at will. She was a kind of Tsarina. We called her Catherine the Fourth. Her conduct was downright brazen. When, making a business trip to Moscow, Nikishov left General Sergei Yegorov in his stead. As often as not, Gridasova, operating as acting camp chief, was issued concrete orders, but she didn't bother to fulfill them. Conflicts went so far as complaining to Stalin himself concerning misdeeds on the part of Nikishov and his temporary spouse. Curiously enough, she managed to put together a good group of actors from among the convicts. There were many remarkable performers. The theater was gorgeous. We had a troupe of some more than 200 performers with voluntary enlistments and convicts. We staged plays, musicals, we staged ballets and operas. There were many good singers and dramatic actors, like Nikonorov, Demisch, Rosenstrauch. Our variety performers included Lundster and Kozen. We staged the Greta Sovereign with Tsar Ivan played by a convict. I, also a convict, played his son. Convicts played many of the main parts. The boyer's part was played by a voluntarily enlisted man. Our costumes were delivered from Moscow's Bolshoi Theater. Nobody would decline Nikoshov's request. It was so strange. I always tried to figure out how these seemingly evil people, hangmen and werewolves, managed to show a human touch. Take one fellow named Drabkin. He was a department chief at the Northeast camps. His wife was in charge of cultural educational work at the Magadan camp and she went to any length to comfort and cheer up people and so forth. She was young and coquettish. We were both young too, which was significant enough perhaps. I'll never forget the words she said to me once. I don't know. I hope she won't be insulted. Right now she lives here in Moscow. She said, last night my husband signed your release. That was in 1945. If he signed it at night, that means she talked him into doing it. After all, why else would anyone in their right mind make such an effort at night? This world should have to know a prison camp. There is much there that no man should see. Every moment of a camp life is a poisoned moment. Pre-felling was seen as penal work. We got up at five in the morning and hurried to run to the canteen for soup and bread. You would put on everything you had, cover your face with rags, leaving only small holes for the eyes. But still it didn't save you from the cold. The snowstorm was so strong that you couldn't see in it, as far as the back of the person in front of you. 
The ranks would be roped together. All around, people held on to each other, with the last one holding the rope. Snowstorms normally lashed while people, sick, emaciated, hungry, struggled through the snowdrifts. Snowdrifts would stop even the horses. They feared huge piles of snow. And convicts had to beat a path through them, for horses respected themselves unlike the humans. Horses would decline to move ahead no matter what you did to them. The horses only brought one third of the required tools, as always. As the guards ordered picking up the implements, we, exerting every effort, would dash to the sledges laden with saws and axes so as to grab the first implement that comes your way. Failure to grab just any implement meant you weren't likely to pull through a day, for you're sure to grow numb with cold. So a fierce battle developed around the sledges. All fought to grab hold of anything, a saw or an axe. I saw how a young woman's nose was sawn away. It was a good 15 kilometers away from the zone when this happened. She choked with blood, but nobody paid attention to her. Besides, everything depended on the team leader. The daily quota was enormous, 14 cubic meters of felled timber. The team leader may register your output or not. If not, a punishment cell was in store for you. The felling site was 15 kilometers away from the camp. On the way back, they arranged their own hallelujahs in the twilight. Tired and hungry, we were ordered to lie in the snow. Some yelled, others prayed, still others cried bitterly. As for the convicts, they would start hooting and whistling and using foul language. To stop it, the escort would launch the dogs on them. The news of Stalin's death caught me at Batugachek camp. We worked and thought, has he already kicked the bucket? Guys in the zone said, not yet, but he will shortly. God be thanked. When he died, the mournful music was played and we all started embracing each other like on Easter. All without exception, regardless of nationality. 
The superiors didn't know what to do. They had no instructions in the event of Stalin's death. The zone donned red flags. But mournful ribbons were not to be seen. There were many immigrants from Harbin, from France, from Eastern Europe. They all raised Russian flags. The Lithuanians raised yellow, green and red flags. The Ukrainians raised a yellow-black standard. People rejoiced, although the practices remained the same. The thaw and Kolyma went on and on. Stalin's death was like a crack at the Gulag Foundation. The camps remained intact for quite a while. They were filled full all across the country. Some two million prisoners remained in the camps after amnesty by official figures. In those years, on the Union map, one of the toughest camps was indicated as a city with a population of 50,000. In Yakut means Death Valley. There were several camps, the lower one, Kutsugan, and Dizelnya in the middle. The central camp station is above the middle one. The female hard labor camp, Vakanka, was across the pass. Right on the top was Hill Camp, or Shaitan in Yakut. Uranite was mined at Butukichak. We moved trolleys laden with uranium ores. Safety precautions were non-existent for us. A voluntary enlisted mining specialist sat behind a shield. Death was a daily occurrence. For months in a row, I stayed in solitary confinement in order to protect myself from the radiation disease. The ore dressing plant was the most horrendous place at Budokchak. It had a dryer with large baking trays and electric stoves. Pokers were used to dry and stir uranite. The job wasn't too hard, only four hours a day. West Ukrainian lads took this job with pleasure rather than toil 14 hours in the mine. After 20 shifts, they, feeling healthy and relaxed, were sent to a special treatment zone where others weren't let in. They shed hair and blood in the ears and noses, and they died. At all camps and zones, when a dead body was taken through the exit booth, a soldier would take a special pick, like a ramrod, and make three punctures in the dead body's chest to make sure it was dead. A graveyard was right there, called the Ammonia Trap. An ammonia storehouse had been there some time ago. I saw different graveyards, but this one was special in a way. There were only stars, not a single cross. 
Further on were different mounds, where there weren't even wooden stars, only numbered planks or unmarked stones, buried there under a sturdy arch of resonant stone and ice, were those who hadn't lived to see freedom. Therefore, they did not deserve to have a star. Every morning, we survivors used to be taken by the duty guard towards the drilling rig far away. We used to march past the graveyard, whose black signs were a grim reminder of continual disgrace. After darkness, the stars came down from the sky and laid on the graves in their numbers stead. The convicts seemed more cheerful after Stalin's death. The power had developed a crack. All rose to their full stature, determined to state their case. The ball was set rolling after a convict was wounded one day. No one in the zone would show up for work. It was a mutiny against Soviet power. The machine was no longer that tough. Our attitude towards it altered dramatically. We demanded that we not be locked in for the night, and no more bars on the barracks windows. We demanded free letter writing and pay for work. A few hours later, a duty officer was brought in. We refused to go to the barrack and shouted, Get out, pirates! I was standing out front, but all those behind me voiced their support. Shooting began, first overhead, then lower and lower, which is something I'm used to. I looked behind, and no one was there. It was decided to create an organized force, so as to hit, not with fanned fingers, but with a clenched fist, and hard. A party was to be created. We banded together and formed the Democratic Party of Russia. And then they scattered us through different camps. It was like dropping a box of matches. Everywhere we went, unrest and disobedience flared up. A wave of uprisings rolled all across Kolyma. There were people there who had gone through many lands and faced death a thousand times. The Lord selected them for the future. They defied bullets and the threat of execution. Shooting at them during escape attempts was useless too. We managed to survive no matter what. Sergei Dmitrovich Solovyov was set free only in 1979. He attempted many escapes and was given additional sentences, but made no compromise with the power. He's still waiting to be rehabilitated. I flee any time, even with a couple days left on my sentence. My thirst for freedom was my moving force, my survival. I made flights from a truck, a train, the zone. I remember a joint getaway by four at Ustilim. They were shot down 15 minutes after they escaped. Significantly enough, all killed escapees lay for weeks in winter by the watchtower. I never stopped trying to escape. 
There were lots of flights, especially in 1953. Those weren't merely flights, but veritable uprisings. Weapons were seized in a bid to break away from the Union, but to flee from Coloma was next to impossible. I would make an escape first of all, that I might take a free breath. And every time I hoped against hope that this time I would be luckier than the last. Several times I attempted to put together a team of five or six in order to make sure they wouldn't eat each other. There were such cases during escapes. When attempting a getaway from the camp, there was a 99% chance he would be shot down. When planning an escape, you'd always get food ready. Once there was a rainfall, and as a result, there was a big ditch. We had three minutes to decide whether to run or not. Without hesitation, we both jumped into the ditch. I found Sirioja, and then we dashed into the tiger. A forest road on the one side spelled our doom. Escort guards, KGB people. On the other side, there was a road. That road meant life. We went out onto the road when we were short of foodstuffs. I never killed, but I needed something to eat. We were spotted and we tried to flee, but pursuers with dogs overtook us. The dogs had gold teeth. They'd had gold teeth put in. They caught us after three days. There were three of us, and the guards fired point blank. I got three bullets in the back. Two of them were removed in 1973. The guards were so lazy, they carried us to the road post to be picked up later. Car drivers witnessed the shooting. The guards left us to go drinking. They were rewarded for killing escapees. Drivers came up to us. They noticed I was still showing signs of life. For 20 days they took care of me, so I survived. I've seen a lot. I've seen death and execution by firing squad. But there is nothing more horrendous than camp work. I don't know. I still can't figure out how we managed to survive. I'd say luck, but the word luck is too far-fetched here. After all, if a prisoner went home alive, it was a failure for the system. The goal they had set was the convict's death. Indeed, was there any use for slave labor? That it didn't pay was realized even then. Whatever convicts did was totally useless. Not a single channel, not a single project became operational. Hapless cities built by the convicts. Fraud permeated them all. and also an underworld, from whence sometimes one returns. 
A person's heart then is full of terror, the eternal horror of that dark world. During my getaway, the frost in the mine was about 18 degrees below zero. We had to eat dry rice. But never before had I seen things like in that prison. It was the most horrible place. No one emerged from it alive. Well, I was captured and given another 24 years, and then another five years. Well, I decided to write a complaint to the United Nations regarding our entire communist state. That was in the year 1955. So I wrote a statement of grievances from Vasilya Kovalev, a builder of communism, a political prisoner, and eternal slave. It took me three months to write the letter listing my problems. I wrote about freedom at large and captivity. I didn't see much difference between them. Slavery is there and here in Soviet concentration camps. I wrote 130 pages stating my case. After I was taken to the Correctional Labor Camps Board, I said there, why are you afraid of me? I'm a downright wreck, only skin and eyes left. He said, you signed your own death verdict and we're not going to shoot you. We're going to let you rot alive for this complaint. Well, this bastard, I guess, must be still alive somewhere now. I was sent to the strict regimen zone stone sack. This meant death. So I heard the outside door open and the dogs breathing. I didn't think they would set it on me, but they let the dog through the doorway and the beast jumped on me. It was heavier than me. I kicked it in the neck. The dog fell down and became quiet. In came six men and started busting me against the wall. I realized I was done for. Having come to, I saw feet sticking up from the corner. They belonged to someone on the floor. The man was dead and frozen to the wall. I couldn't rise. My arms and legs were smashed. For a month, I had to eat like a dog. They were real beasts, worse than Gestapo men. They were the communist red Gestapo. Hatred for the Soviet communist regime was the only thing they couldn't wrest from me. They took my freedom and everything else except this hatred. I hated them with my eyes, my thoughts. I'll keep hating them even into the beyond. the van in port, the soaked and decomposing boat. There we climbed upon the gangway and shoved into the freezing hold. Curse upon you, Coloma, one of the wonders of the world. One way or another, a man goes mad, and then there's no return. <laughs> Oh, 
шерю, Там смерть подружилась со мной. Набитые битком лазареты На просмотре весной. И я жду от любимых ответа. Brothers and sisters killed wantonly, now reposing in unmarked graves in the chilly Kulema. May your memory live forever. The documents of these times have been destroyed. The watchtowers sawn down, the barracks razed. The barbed wire rolled up and taken to some other place. Now flourishing on the camp's ruins is fireweed and neglect, the foe of archives and of human memory. Did we exist at all? I reply, we did. I have declared that through each inexorable moment. I declare it with full responsibility for this, our document. Mikhail Mikheyev, cameraman Andrei Andreev, sound Natalia Solomonik, composer Dmitry Pavlov, English text and translation by Anatoly Antohin and Gwendolyn Womack, voiceover by Daniel Kleinfeld, Liz Hilliard, Sven Holmberg, Brett Levy, and Oleg Kulikovich.